Hello, everybody. Nate Hagerty here again. And you're listening to the Pro Marketer Podcast, where whether you are in tax compliance, prep, resolution, accounting, or any of the other many slices of our crazy tax and accounting industry, we bring you the tools and strategies to market and build your practice like a pro. And I am a little bit, I'm fanboying a little bit today, if I may, talking to Ryan Lazanis, CPA. He is somebody that I have, I was just telling him before we started recording, I've paid attention to a lot of content producers in our world for the almost 20 years that I've been in this world. And it's rare to find somebody like Ryan who demonstrates such uh, excellence and under, deep understanding of direct response marketing principles, how to copyright and do salesmanship in an effective manner online and in the written form. and yet who uses those skills with care and concern. And what I mean by that is that you know, there are many out there who, golly, are using every trick in the book from false scarcity to you know uh, price tricky things to neuro-linguistic programming tricks and how they present their information, anchoring all of the different persuasion tactics that you know, if you have read persuasion, I'm sure Ryan has, then uh, you understand what I'm talking about. But Ryan uses these with such care and is able to highlight them for his audience. And he just, he's created an environment of collaboration in his world. And so I'm excited for you to get to know him. And if you're not following him already, and I imagine a lot of people are, I hope that you will. So he is a CPA and he founded Zen. Am I saying that right, Ryan? Zen? Zen, you got it. But with an X. Not That's with a right. Z, uh, which was a hundred percent cloud-based firm back in 2013, when most people were not doing cloud-based firms. Now that's like the hot thing in our world, but golly, he was a forerunner in that model. So he sold that firm in 2018. I'm assuming that's what it means when you said you were acquired. Yes. I sure hope so. Yes. <laughs> and he started Future Firm about four and a half years ago, which provides education, community, and coaching to help accountants, both tax and non-tax, quickly scale an awesome firm of their own and that improves their lifestyle. So he's got 7,000 people on his newsletter, which is nothing to sneeze at. And he has hundreds of coaching clients, you know, firms, through, you know, whether in Canada and the United States, probably in the UK as well, I'm assuming. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Australia, all over the English speaking world, unless you're bilingual or trilingual. Do you speak other languages, Ryan? I speak French. You speak French. So do you have yeah. clients in France? I, I mean, it's an English program, uh, but we have, <laughs> we have members in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Singapore, wow. Uh, wow. all over the world. It's very interesting. Wow. That is fascinating. I want to hear about that in a moment, but here's a quick fun fact before we dive into a little bit more of his story. So Ryan just last weekend ran his first full triathlon in July. He did a half. He's a full fledged triathlon. Everybody. He's an iron man. He's, you know, he did it in Hawaii. Um, I'm kidding. Obviously <laughs> not quite but, yet. <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> but being a really close friend of mine was a sponsored triathlete and I know what it takes to train and build into a full triathlon. So bravo. Thank you very much. Great introduction. I appreciate that, Nate. Oh, my pleasure. So I would love to hear your story. I read something or listened to something that you put out recently about the things that you would have done differently running your firm. And I think that's a great place to start. If you would, I gave the kind of very quick thumbnail related to Zen Accounting back yep. in 2013. But maybe you could tell us the story a little bit more, like what brought you to start it? Why cloud accounting? And then there's a lot to talk about from there. Yeah, I think, you know, my first accounting job was working at a very small traditional accounting firm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, it was a non-stimulating environment. <laughs> so it was not a great environment to work in. And it wasn't a great customer experience on the other end either. You know, people had to come into the office, bring their box of papers, sign documents. Like it was so inconvenient and impractical. Yeah. And I always identified with the entrepreneur side of things. I always deep down, I'm more of an entrepreneur than an accountant. I'm actually, even though I'm a CPA, I'm a terrible accountant, uh, <laughs> reconciling things just doesn't click for me. Mm -hmm. So I always identified with the entrepreneur and I said, uh, you know, when I left public practice, I went into uh, industry briefly. I just hated the monotony of doing month-end closes as an assistant controller, month in, month out, mm -hmm. extremely boring. 
and I wanted to start my own business. And the only thing I knew how to do was accounting. So I decided to start an accounting firm and, um, but I wanted to create one that just made people's lives better. One that like made things easier for them and made accounting less painful. And I came up with the idea, well, let's just do it all online. And at a time when nobody was doing it online, right, um, right. you know, when I quit my job and I told them what I was going to do, they like, people laughed at me, mm. you know, my director of finance thought it was the most ridiculous idea he ever heard. And mm. are uh, you still in touch with him? <laughs> no, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, maybe he's on know, your like, list. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> But, you know, he's like, no one wants to meet with their accountant online and nobody's going to want to use these different apps mm. that, that you're mm. that you're talking about. And I didn't know either. I was prepared to go, you know, my mentally, I was prepared to go six months without any client before I called it quits because I was oh. starting from scratch. And uh, yeah, so I started just with an idea of like, what are all the pain points in an accounting firm and how could I inverse those? So people hate their surprise bills. Okay. Let's show them prices ahead of the, ahead of time on a fixed monthly price basis. People don't want to see their accountant. Let's meet online on Skype. Let's um, not even ever talk. Just kidding. Exactly. <laughs> almost. I mean, look, uh, that, that was the direction I wanted to take the firm is like, let's just eliminate all those unnecessary touch points mm. with your accounting firm. So I just wanted to make a smooth, easy experience. And that's how I started Zen accounting was just like using these online tools, meeting clients on Skype, you know, built up a network of like tech startups that wanted that kind of approach in that age and uh, just built up a reputation for being a first mover in the space, mm -hmm. uh, grew the firm from scratch all the way to sale over a five year period. And, you know, yeah, so I, I don't know uh, if that answers your question. No, that does. So let's dive into those mistakes. Yeah. Now that we've talked to you up and, you know, blown up your ego, not that, not that you really, not that we really are because <laughs> you are a very self-aware person, but just because I think a lot of people who might be listening to this, maybe don't have such a clean story. Yeah. Let's l let people into yeah. the bumps in the road. Like one of the things that I heard you talk about was your difficulty with delegation. And yeah. this is. I believe a very pressing reality for a lot of firms right now because yeah. of the supposed, you know, great resignation, quiet quitting, all of the things that people are talking about out there and the difficulty in hiring, et cetera. Um, in my opinion, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, a lot of that conversation is actually covering over a deeper issue in most practices and most professional service companies in general where it's really about management, leadership, and culture, rather than poor hiring or lack of good people to find, what have you. And that's all tied up in how you delegate, right? So talk about that as, as in your experience with your firm. And I know you've done a lot of coaching around this area too. So I'd, I just would love your perspective on that concept. I think like there's a certain personalities that accountants have that just like, you know, they take a lot of pride in their work and, you know, they feel a responsibility to their account, to their clients to do a great job. And they have a hard time letting go of like not reviewing the client work or not being the final approver or the final person to sign off. And certainly I felt some of that as well, but you know, firms also, the people running firms also think they're the only one could, that could run the sales that they have to handle all the sales calls that come in and deal with all the prospects and help onboard them. And I think I did a decent job delegating, like better than average, I'd say when comparing mm -hmm. to other firms, but it was a very interesting process that when you take a firm from scratch all the way to sale and are transitioning the firm to another buyer, you can, I was able to see in that process, like every little thing that I held on to that I shouldn't have, because I literally gave up a hundred percent of what I was doing to mm -hmm. someone else. And I was like, well, why wasn't I doing that earlier? Why did I handle every single sales call? Why did I handle like this little administrative task for like that anyone could have handled for the last three years? Why did I, why am I still handling this one particular client, you know? So I, I don't know if I'm really answering your question here. Yeah, Nate. no, you are. Uh, so how would you recommend somebody who's maybe in that place without, what would you say to yourself in that mode? Like there's the Ryan post acquisition yeah. who is able to see things a little bit more clearly as you described, but is there anything that you could have, somebody could have said to you that would have kicked you out of that modality? I mean, 
pretty much a hundred percent of what you do can be delegated, you know, yeah. and it's just a question of identifying what provides you with the most, like write a whole list of what you do in your firm right now and identify the areas that provide the most leverage. And we just want to do that. And then the other things, those can be delegated. We maybe need to hire people. We maybe need to upskill some people on the team. You know, it does take some work. It does take some time, but it's well worth the investment because we can create a lot more leverage in your business. If we can free up more of your time to focus on what you're really, really good at and where you provide maximum value to the business and also help remove you from the bottleneck because that's the big issue I see with most firms is that, you know, the owner, the partner, they're just the bottleneck of the business. Everything funnels up to them. They get stretched way too thin, deal with way too much stress and yeah, they can grow the top line, but at the expense of their work-life balance. I mean, that, that is almost every <laughs> tax accounting principle that, that I know, especially those that are in startup mode, it's a very, very tempting ditch to fall into just holding on to every It's easy. Component. It's easier. It's actually easier. Yeah. That's, that's the reason you can just, you know how to do it. You have comfort over how to do it. You think it, oh, this little thing doesn't take me that long. I'll just keep doing it. And it just snowballs. Yeah. And control underneath it. I mean, there, there's subterranean realities that sometimes people need to deal with like in their soul related to fear and related to what's their identity and how are they evaluating success of their business? Because I think a lot of the reasons why people don't eat more easily, let go of those things is that they've attached so much significance to these little things. When in fact, if they were able to remove themselves, like have a clearer sense of where they're going and the power in their business, it would be a lot easier. But yeah, leverage, leverage is everything, isn't it? I mean, identifying Definitely. points of leverage. I feel like I, I've written about that a lot. If there is one word that if we could just sort of like meditate upon, and it, it's often used obviously in financial contexts, but we're talking about time. We're talking about people. We're talking about, you know, skill sets and finding those points of leverage. So important. That's good. All right. So you also talked about, well, let's talk about the acquisition for a moment because sure. I, I know that that would be a nice outcome for a lot of people. Yep. And there's a lot of practices and even firms for sale right now, given demographic realities in our industry. So there's the buy side and the sell side. So having gone through the sell side, what are some things that you would have done differently looking back aside from make more, get more money? Um, you know what, like I, I get asked that question a lot. There's probably nothing I would have done radically different. I think like, I think going back to the delegation thing, I think, it, you know, if I would have delegated more, I would have been able to grow it significantly larger hmm. and, uh, you know, obviously fetched a higher mm -hmm. dollar amount upon sale. So I think that's one thing I would have done is like learn to let go a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I mean, yeah, there's a ton of mistakes I made running that business. You know, I made pretty much all the mistakes possible, ran into all the pitfalls. And that's why Future Firm exists in the first place is to help right. others avoid those mistakes. It's the resource I wish I had when I was running my firm. Yeah, like pricing is something that you, you talk oh, about yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. Like, it was disastrous. Like I had these, like I was actually really, I look back, I did a presentation like, I don't know, maybe six months ago on pricing. And I look back at the very, very first packages that I had was advertising on my website. And actually that was, it was pretty avant-garde at the moment to like hmm. put these gold, silver, bronze plans on your mm -hmm. site and like have like, this is how much it's going to cost per month. And like, these are, you get all this technology. Oh yeah. I was talking about that back then, hoping that I would see somebody do it. I hadn't seen, I didn't see anybody doing it. Yeah. So actually my first iteration of it, when I launched the website, it was like, pick a package, put your credit card in, don't even talk to me. Yeah. And people were doing it, which was kind of cool. But first off, they were picking the wrong packages. Yeah. And second, I was literally giving it away. I probably should have just been a volunteer at that point because mm. it's like the package included like everything you could imagine, unlimited consultation, 150 bucks a month. Oh, like, I was like, gonna, I was gonna oh, say 500 bucks a oh, month. That sounds crazy to me. I have a 150 a month. Oh my god. I golly. have a screenshot of those packages and I show it in presentations like. You think, I, I understand what you're going through when you're talking about you don't know how to price because I did that the hard way. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I gave this all away 
And yeah, they were great packages, just horrible prices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's one thing I would have done differently. It's just like priced way, way higher right out the gate. There's a lot of this. It's a lot of it is just confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have the confidence to like actually charge those because you don't want to scare the client away because you're trying to build up your firm. But if you have the right framework in place, it actually makes it very easy to charge much higher prices. So that's what I also learned the hard way. Okay, so let's pause there. When you say you have when you, when you have the right framework in place, yep. uh, there's a lot like uh, th those words are doing a lot of work. So what what would you say that entails? The right framework. Are you talking about the actual presentation? Are you talking about and uh, and by that I mean like the pitch deck, so to speak, when after you've done the discovery session with the client? All um, of it. Okay, so talk because, to me about that. Because charging a high price has everything to do with like what happens, the steps you take before you actually set a price, yep. coming up with the price and packages, and then actually presenting, presenting them and having a client pick a package. So, <clears throat> so like when it comes to pricing high, it comes down to like how are we building up the value of like your solutions before you actually show them what the price is. Mm -hmm. So it really starts with like, what's your discovery call framework look like? Like what questions are you asking? What information are you extracting? Because only with that in information are we able to determine, okay, how high can we price things? Then I get into a, a, an approach where we should be building out for almost everything you do. You can do gold, silver, bronze packages. Mm -hmm. and there's a few reasons why I like that. We don't oh, necessarily need to get into that. There's lots of them. And, and we're getting yeah. into the, some of these great powers conversations because this is a this is one of those sort of not manipulative, but it's definitely like a tactical, important thing to understand in terms of psychology of how it, correct. It's all choose. psychology. Right. I mean, pricing is all about psychology. It is. It is. Sales and marketing is all about psychology as well. It really is. Relation because, in my opinion, and check me on this if you disagree. I see marketing, and I've run a marketing agency for a long time, as building relationships but doing it at scale. Um, mm -hmm. And relationship building is about psychology in the real world. I mean, yep. you end up meeting somebody at a cocktail party and you talk about yourself the whole time. Mm, it's not going to be a deep relationship or vice versa, right? But if you can find a way to engage, the psychology of uh, human interaction is that people love talking about themselves. And so if you can give them a platform to tell you about themselves and you actually are interested in what they talk about, then suddenly they feel like you're their best friend. Um, yep. And the same is true at scale. And so if you can give people the sense, A, that you care, B, that you're trustworthy, and C, that like you have a path for them that is clear, they're going to have a lot of confidence to pay whatever they need to pay. So I agree with that. And yeah, so I mean, you know, getting back to the reason why I like to show three options is because... I think one of the big reasons is, yes, there's psychology behind it, but most accountants, most firm owners or partners or principals, they're not, they're not salesmen or saleswomen. And, right. and if the simple fact of just saying, here's our basic option at a basic price, but by the way, we have these other options for you as well at more premium service levels and more premium price, just the simple fact of doing that, you'll see that a large majority are not actually going to take the base option. Mm -hmm. So just... You don't have to even know how to sell. Mm -hmm. you, you just have to know how to understand what someone needs, put together a few options, present those options to them, and you'll be surprised at how many are going to pick the silver or gold mm -hmm. prices and packages, which will move you up the ladder. So right. that alone, if you, do, if you just do that and not follow anything else, you'll be in a, specific, a much better position than if, you just folk, uh, than if you just put out one price at, with one package. Because you're giving people a yes or yes option rather Correct. than a yes or no binary up or down kind of choice. Correct. And then as you probably discovered, probably 70% of your audience will, or your meetings will usually choose the middle option. And then there's the extremes on both sides. It really follows that. I mean, Correct. almost maybe 80, 20, the very natural. That's why they call it the Goldilocks method because right. the middle is just right. Yep. I love that. All right. So you started Future Firm after you sold this. And let's hear about that immediately. That's yeah. wonderful. So you didn't have an NDA in any kind of way that prevented you from doing that. Correct. Uh, 
Yeah, it, well, before we dive into the future firm, and I want to hear more about that, let's talk about the transaction again, if yeah. you would. How did you find the buyer? Back then, there was it was a different kind of marketplace, probably. Those who are interested in selling their practice right now are facing a little bit more competition, in, at least from what I can see out there. There's a lot of practices available, and so there's actually a, there's a buying opportunity for people, in my opinion, and there's a lot of people who are probably willing to make good deals to offload their practice. But how did you find your buyer? How did that happen? So selling my firm was never a thought, never an mm -hmm. idea. I never thought that I would actually sell the business. My dad was, you know, had a business, small business of his own and he just, his full life. And I just mm -hmm. kind of thought I would be doing that as well. But a couple years in, maybe like three, three and a half years in, like being one of the front runners in the cloud accounting space started getting approached by other firms that wanted to like, Hey, like, why don't we partner? Why don't we merge? Maybe, you know, we'll acquire you. Like all these different types of possibilities came up, which presented a very confusing time in my life about, okay, mm -hmm. like, what do I do? These are like, I have tons of great opportunities. I have a business that's growing. Business is going great. Like, what do I actually do? And it really forced me to rethink my purpose. Hmm. It was probably the most confusing time of my life. And my wife was probably really sick of hearing me talk about what should I do in this well, situation. Well, good that's on you that you'd process with her. A lot of people yeah. just do it internally. That's, yeah. That's um, so, so yeah, marriage. I mean, it forced me to rethink my purpose. And my purpose was, you know, when I started Future Firm, actually, I was always really frustrated with the accounting profession, frustrated with the lack of forward movement and progress. And I always mm -hmm. found it archaic. Mm -hmm. And my purpose was actually to help advance the accounting profession. Hmm. And I don't think our professional bodies do nearly to promote innovation or to help the small accounting firms and to help them create a better business model because truthfully the business model of like the traditional firm is not a good business model. And that's what selling, I wanted to do. Is, you mean selling hours for dollars? Selling hours, but if you just look at the type of lifestyles that are produced from those mm -hmm. running accounting firms, they're not like the type of lifestyle that most would aspire to. Right. You know, who wants to work those 80 hour busy seasons? And even outside of busy season, it's like ripe with stress and it's just, it's a tough, tough business to run. Especially if they and, have corporate clients, but yes, carry exactly. On. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just wanted to help create, help others create a better business model, help advance the accounting profession and use all the painful lessons that I learned taking my firm from scratch to sale and help others. So that's really how, like when I, when that became clear, I said, okay, I want to sell the firm and I want to start future firm. Because you even started the firm with a mission of that. I mean, you were already pushing against the, the inertia of the industry when you did it. Correct. So why not do that even more directly? Correct. Future firm? Right. Correct. So that's when I had different competing offers already. And I said, you know what, let's expand the pool. And I listed it with, I listed the firm with a broker as well. Hmm. And just so happened that the best offer came firm broker. out of the Isle of Man of all places. Hmm. And I got wow. to fly there, sign the deal. It was a very interesting, it's wonderful, very interesting experience. Yeah. So I learned Beautiful a lot, place. like actually going through that whole process. Hmm. Yeah. Well, can, do you mind unpacking a few of those things for those who might be selling soon? Like what, what did you do well in the sale and what did you wish that you had Done better. So I think one thing I did very well because I wasted a lot of time with leading up to that. I wasted so much time with like just meeting other firms that like, you know, were courting, let's say, yeah. and just the whole like meeting people at the firms and then having other meetings. And then we get to like, what do you really want? And not being clear flirting. about what you want. Flirting. Yeah. It's just flirting and not like, it was me not knowing exactly what I wanted. And that just led to a lot of wasted time. And when they would submit some kind of proposal or offer, it's just like, no, this is like way off. This is not even close to interesting. Mm -hmm. So it, at a certain point, it's like, okay, let me back up. Let me say, if I'm going to sell, this is exactly what I want. This is exactly what I want the terms to look like. This is the price I'm looking for all the details. And I just put it out there. I say, this is what it's going to take. Like, we're, I'm not going to have 20 meetings with you to determine like what it's going to be. 
I'm going to be clear with you up front. This is exactly what I'm going to do when I sell the firm. This is exactly the purchase price I'm looking for. These are the details. Like if you're interested, let's proceed to the next step. So that's what I would say. If, if you're looking to sell, just be very clear about what you want and uh, just make that known early on in the process. That's really good advice. Instead of just sort of like letting the process come and hoping that you hit the lottery. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So future firm, we have a sense of your mission, which is moving the accounting practice forward, especially from a technology stack standpoint. I noticed that you are very app forward in your newsletters. I've been reading your newsletter for quite some time. I've commented on your stuff occasionally. So tech integration and whatnot is a huge part of what you find yourself at least writing to the public, but is there a particular other distinctive related to future firms you want to highlight? So when I first started future firm, I was actually at more of a technology and process consultant. Okay. And I thought like, that's what I would do to help bring f firms into the future and to help them create a better firm is like, let's just focus on technology and process. And that's what everyone's asking for. Everyone wants automation and they have right. these problems in their firm. And the first thing they think about is let's automate more. Right. In 2018, first... automation was everything. Exactly. And the first few engagements I was bringing on was like these uh, consulting engagements where, you know, I would analyze all their technology and processes and issue like a 50, 60 page report with like findings and recommendations. First off, I hated doing that. Hmm. But second off, I realized that these firms that were coming to me, they already had, the, they were in a chaotic state, but they already had enough technology. Like I was mm -hmm. making incremental changes mm -hmm. uh, to their business and technology wasn't what was causing them to have all these issues. It wasn't why all these people were overworked and it wasn't why like the people running the firms, like were working all these crazy hours and had the chaos at their business. It was because of other things. It was because they weren't charging enough. They were doing too much for too little. They didn't have packages for their services that could be delivered systematically across their business. They didn't have the right team structure. So they were the bottleneck of their business. They didn't have the right people on board to help support the growth. So it was all these, you know, they had no marketing engine whatsoever. So they were like literally hunting for clients in a variety of different manners, which were ineffective mm -hmm. as I'm sure you see all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was actually not technology that was the problem. It's what they thought they needed, but it was all these other foundational things they needed to fix first before they could actually really reap the real rewards of automation and technology. So that allowed me to then focus on, okay, future firm helps provide coaching and content and education and community in a way that's going to help them establish a very strong business model in all the elements I just mentioned to help them actually truly create a scalable systematic firm. I love that. So it's almost been like technology consulting was your camel's nose in the tent to see all these other issues. And, um, say so. and I imagine that's probably still the case because you still are passionate about tech stack and technology integrations clearly, but, but what they reveal and how to properly use them is the points of leverage that a lot of people need help with. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that I'd say is one of the things that you highlighted as well in I've seen it in a bunch of your content related to the dearth of good coaches, the dearth of good guidance for accountants. I think that's changed in the last three or four years. Some people like you, Jackie Meyer, there's other people out there that I'm sure there's a bunch that you would love to highlight other people doing this well, but talk about what it looks like for somebody to work with you and get your guidance. Like what? When yeah. you, when they agree to be a part of the community, what have you? So yeah, that's what I'm completely focused on at the moment is the future firm accelerate community, which is a mm. really awesome group of people. I launched mm. it about a year and a half because I was doing some one-to-one -one coaching when I first started future firm, but then realized the issues that everyone was having were very similar. And that allowed me to produce actionable, practical content in the form of online courses, templates, and other resources that I load up into the Future Firm Accelerate platform. So Future Firm Accelerate is an online coaching mm -hmm. membership program where members get access to step-by-step -step trainings that show them how to actually create a scalable systematic firm that show them how to price their services, how to market themselves, how to, how to you know, hire good people in this day and age, all the different elements that are required to create a 
great business for themselves. They get access to a community of now over 600 other like-minded firms, primarily from Canada and the US, but really from all around the world as well. Yeah, you and mentioned that, Singapore, Pakistan, all over the place. That's got to create some Europe. very interesting chemical combinations and conversations. And, and yeah, I love that the most because, you know, when I was first, first starting my firm, the places I was looking to was not Canada and the US. I was looking to places like Australia, New Zealand, which were more ahead of the curve. So hmm. if you get all these people together to kind of share ideas of what's working in different jurisdictions, you're able to actually help position your firm in a far different way just by kind of being able to pick apart what others are doing really well. So yeah, that, that community is a gold mine. And uh, then there's some group coaching. So when members get stuck, when members need my help, they could just pop into a monthly ask me anything call and get all their questions answered. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm uh, quite busy with at the moment. So now that you've been doing that for a year and a half, and yep. you've gotten this sort of 10,000 foot perspective on so many other firms. Mm -hmm. What do you see differently now that you maybe didn't see when you were just running your own firm? That's a very good question. What do I see differently now that I didn't and see? And what I mean by it is like the challenges, you might have not had these challenges yourself. Like what are yeah. some of the common challenges that you see? You know what? Honestly, I don't think the challenges have changed. And that's okay. what like, and the challenges that I'm helping with are, I think, challenges that we face everywhere in the world, no matter where you're located. And it's the big common themes that you'd see in most firms. And it's the ones that I had to deal with as well. So I don't think there's anything new mm -hmm. that's emerged since I ran my firm. That's like, wow, this is like a totally new issue. It's mm -hmm. still the same. Like they need help creating a better business model. Mm -hmm. They need help. Like, this is how we price. This is how we sell. This is how we market. This is how we find good people. But you know, this is how we do it in 2022, you know? So yeah, it's the same issues. Yeah. That, you know, creating I, a vision for yourself. So you're creating the kind of business that you want. You know, that's one of the other mistakes I made is like just jumping into the business, losing sight of what I really, really wanted out of life and just the business snowballing into something. And before you know it, like you're stuck in the middle of it. You know, these are all the things, these are the same issues that I face and the same issues that all these members need help with. So if you want to get connected to Ryan and I, you know, I urge you to do so, you know, in some ways, like I, I've got no pre-existing relationship with Ryan. I've really brought him on here. Number one, actually, this has been my platform to hear your story a little bit more, Ryan, and get to know you. And I'm, I love your story, but I just want my audience to hear, like, there's no quid pro quo here going on. I'm endorsing Ryan because of what I've seen from him over the years and the excellence of his work. And I imagine within his community, it is pretty rocking and rolling. So futurefirm.co is going to unlock the key to everything. And what about on social media? What do you have a preferred place that you do anything there? I'm actually or... trying to be less active on social media. Amen to that. Yeah. Amen so, to that. Um, Me too. Yeah. My, my primary medium is email. Uh, Me too. I'm most active on LinkedIn, I'd say, but I've recently, you know, several months back, I just made the decision to get all these apps off my phone and yeah. uh, I'll check it on, on you know, maybe I'm uh, posting ghosts turning into an old, maybe I'm turning into an old man now, Nate, but <laughs> you're a dad now, brother. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it changes the game. Yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, but yeah, the best place is futurefirm.co slash newsletter. Hop yeah. on the newsletter. I respond to all emails. Someone responds to one of the newsletter editions. I'm going to respond back. Anyone that shoots me an email, I'm going to respond to. That's true. Well, Ryan, this is awesome. The four, like last question, uh, where do you see the industry? Like, what are the challenges ahead? If you could sort of look in your crystal ball, over the next couple of years, leaving aside legislation, you know, accounting standards, whatever changing, what's kind of across the board, aside from these kind of general sales, marketing, pipeline, pricing, like industry specific challenges yeah. that you see? It's really impossible to predict, but one mm -hmm. thing that I think people are cluing into is how to actually, I think firms are getting really slick in their marketing right now and really slick in their positioning. And there's a lot of venture capital coming in and like, it's unproven whether these venture capital backed models are actually going to pan out or not. 
Hmm. But there's all they're able to pump a lot of money into like proprietary technology and hmm. algorithms and AI and machine learning and like who knows what that turns into. But I see the competition really transforming right now. And you're really hmm. not going against these like mom and pop shops. Hmm. You're not going against these traditional firms. You're going against some pretty slick models at the moment. And a lot of it is just really good like marketing. Mm -hmm. Like, so who knows what's actually behind it? Mm -hmm. But I feel like the clients, accounting clients have been so underserved for such a long time. And like people smell the opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, whenever there's like an industry that just doesn't serve their clients in the way they want to be served, because let's face it, clients still hate their accounting tax all that stuff, like venture capital money smells that and pours into the space. Disruption so, is in the air. Yes. Correct. Now, who knows what happened? It's a tough, it's a tough, it's not like taking a taxi. It's not like Uber and they transform the taxi industry. You know, here we're giving advice. It's a little it's bit Uber different. Uber of the accounting industry. <laughs> yeah. So like, who knows where it goes, but I just see a lot of slick stuff taking place right now. The competition is different. And that's what I really have a heavy eye on. Hmm. In my opinion, the automation and the AI driven solutions that are emerging are going to get more and more sophisticated, obviously, but what cannot be scaled and what cannot be duplicated is personality and trust and yeah. the one-on-one -on -one conversation. And if there is a way somehow in your practice to scale the non-scalable things. And by that, I mean like conversations and finding the kind of people that can serve your clients well. Like if, if you are a really good recruiter and trainer in this industry, I think you are going to build something amazing because as you rightly pointed out, most accountants are not good at communicating with their clients. They're not good at telling the story. They're not good at kind of like taking their clients by the hand and helping them navigate the hoary fields of, you know, P and L's, what have you, and all the different things. And if you can do that effectively, just from a relational standpoint, or find other people who can, all of the AI kind of leveraged technology is not going to remove you from that relationship because people are relational still and are craving it. So it's not about the awesome email sequence automations anymore. That was cool 10 years ago. It's now more about the how can you get your personality and build the relationship of trust like with in a one-on-one -on -one way? And I know that's such a boring answer from a marketer type, but I'm seeing this across. I don't know if you follow digital marketer, Ryan, but like this is what they talked about their last huge summit, like the most scalable thing, the most cutting edge media right now is email. And because email is the most relational medium, because it's the most siloed, piece of communication that you can have in the online space. And so people who get good at it and are able to write with panache and create good content, that's where things are, I think. So I think that's a fair point. So we'll see who's right in 10 years. Yeah. Well, that's great. All right, Ryan. Well, this was fun. Thank you again. And everybody again, futurefirm.co, check them out, check out their accelerate community it has my highest endorsement. Um, Really, really pleased to, to introduce you guys to Ryan if you haven't already connected with him. So thank you again, Ryan. This was fun. Thank you very much, Nate. Much appreciated. All right, brother.